Good afternoon. Uh, at NOAA SARSET, we're responsible basically for uh, uh, monitoring emergency alerts and then sending those alerts directly through our ground systems and our communication systems uh, to search and rescue authorities. And in the US, that would be the Coast Guard or the Air Force uh, because they're the ones that are uh, uh, mandated to do SAR in the United States. Uh, now, what do I mean by distress alerts? Uh, basically, if you're in trouble anywhere in the world and you have a specific device that I'm gonna talk about here in a minute, you can uh, activate that device and our satellites will locate your position and then send that to a search and rescue uh, forces and they'll be able to find you. So these are the, the devices I was talking about. They're emergency beacons. And uh, some already existed before this program. These are emergency locator transmitters and they were located, they were uh, uh, used on aircraft uh, even before this, this system. Uh, and uh, uh, the limiting factor there was another airplane had to be up uh, and monitor the frequency that these uh, ELTs were giving off. So it was a, a much smaller search area than you have now with the satellites. Because basically with the satellites, you can search the entire Earth. And with the, uh, the aircraft, you can only search specific uh, areas and you had to worry about weather, and you had to worry about fuel, and you had to worry about uh, your budget uh, for the various search and rescue uh, uh, agencies. Uh, but uh, now, with it being a worldwide program uh, monitored by satellite, it's uh, uh, offered a lot of help and assistance to, to people over the years. And uh, the different types of beacon have, beacons have grown uh, instead of just aircraft now. Uh, they have uh, beacons for uh, ships. These are called EPIRBs, Emergency Position Indicating Radio Beacons. Uh, if you ever watch The Deadliest Catch and you hear some beeping going off on the radio or something, they're, they're talking about these, these EPIRBs. Uh, and now even individuals, like if you're a hiker going off in the Grand Canyon or if you're a skier out in the uh, Rocky Mountains or a kayaker uh, you know, down in the, the Florida Keys or something, you can wear one of these on your person, so if you get in trouble, that you can activate it and somebody will come find you. This has become uh, a cottage industry and uh, uh, companies that were already involved with uh, search and rescue equipment like rescue lights and uh, 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 PFDs, uh, light jackets, that sort of thing, uh, started manufacturing these and there's about a million and a half uh, worldwide in the population right now, so. So some other advancements that have happened uh, since, uh, you know, the experiments with Nimbus. Uh, we started using geostationary satellites as well as the polar orbiting. And uh, this gave some, uh, some better capabilities for one uh, we've got a much larger search area at any given time. With the orbiting satellites, there was a 2,500, uh, well, yeah, 2,500 mile uh, diameter footprint. So if you were in trouble and you turned on your device right after the satellite passed you, then you might be waiting there for a while until that next satellite passed over. So it may be 20 or 40 minutes after you press that button before we would receive that signal to the satellite. Whereas uh, geostationary, <laughs> has a footprint that is basically almost the entire size of the hemisphere. So, uh, you know, if you're anywhere in North or South America, pretty much uh, as long as you're not near the poles, that, st that geostationary satellite can see you almost instantly when you uh, uh, light off your beacon. Uh, another advancement was uh, uh, a few years uh, back in the 80s, uh, we had GPS. In the late 80s, early 90s, we were able to get the GPS signal uh, put on our beacons. So when you turn on the beacon, there's a GPS chip in there. It can initialize with the GPS satellite and then send that GPS position straight to the geostationary satellite or the polar orbiting satellite. And we'd be able to uh, uh, have the type of position information we got previously with the, uh, the, the Nimbus-derived uh, location protocols, 
and also with the GPS protocol. So the Coast Guard gets both those types of information still. On the program side, uh, SARSAT has grown a lot. Uh, it started as an international program and it's still international. Uh, there's a lot of international collaboration, uh, international organizations uh, involved with the UN uh, uh, make recommendations for carriage. So for instance, the uh, International Maritime Organization will mandate carriage for uh, commercial ships uh, for the uh, so they're involved with the uh, EPIRBs and the International Civil Aviation Organization uh, or ICAO uh, will be involved with uh, mandating the use of uh, emergency locator transmitters. And then you have the uh, International Telecommunications Union, ITU, which basically tells you know, the, the world to stay away from that uh, 406 megahertz frequency is, which is what our, uh, our beacons use and it protects that frequency from radio stations and uh, communications companies from using that frequency. So it's dedicated for, for search and rescue throughout the world. And likewise, uh, talking about, uh, we talked earlier about how this was developed with uh, the United States, Canada, and uh, uh, France, and Russia at the time. And if you remember back in the 70s, we weren't too friendly with Russia on, on most things, but we were able to find agreement here. Uh, now that uh, uh, there are over 43 countries that participate directly with this program, and uh, uh, they actually have uh, you know, input into uh, how the program is run, but there's even more countries involved with the search and rescue aspect. So all these countries in green are actually receiving the alerts, but they may uh, push that information out to those countries around them, to their various search and rescue organizations. So, uh, you know, basically this entire map should be green with the exception, with, with some exceptions, possibly North Korea and Iran or something. It might not be on board, but uh, uh, pretty, pretty much the entire world is tied into to this system now for search and rescue. Then on a national level, you know, several agencies govern its use. Uh, uh, NOAA has oversight now. Uh, NASA developed it, but since they were weather satellites under the auspice of, of NOAA, uh, that SARSAT program uh, became, uh, came under, under us. Uh, so we coordinate with, uh, again, the Air Force for Inland SAR, uh, the Coast Guard for Maritime, and uh, uh, we still work with NASA. There's a, a group over here uh, that does uh, uh, research and development for uh, SARSAT. And uh, uh, we uh, coordinate on a daily uh, basis with, well, at least a quarterly basis with, uh, with meetings and such with, uh, with them here. And uh, I think Lisa, Dr. Lisa Mazuka heads that. She's with NASA. And then uh, on the flip side, uh, SARSAT is directly involved with uh, the National Search and Rescue Committee, and uh, we're involved with the National Search and Rescue Plan. Uh, so we, we advise uh, uh, them with uh, SARSAT developments. SARSAT has been uh, uh, seamlessly integrated into the search and rescue community within the United States. Uh, you can see here the Air Force and the Coast Guard have lines drawn for their responsibilities. Uh, here are the various Coast Guard districts here. And uh, what happens is when we get an alert, it goes through our, our servers electronically so we don't even see it. Uh, and then it goes to the Air Force and Coast Guard search and rescue uh, uh, programs. So. Here you see a screenshot of the Coast Guard's uh, search and rescue program that they use. And these are actual alerts that are from our satellites that just pop up on their screen and they'll, they can uh, gather all the information uh, right at their fingertips. Uh, as we saw earlier, you can basically be in the most remote parts of the world and uh, 
the satellites can locate you. And here's an example. Uh, this young lady named Abby Sutherland wanted to be the uh, youngest person, it's either the youngest person or youngest female, I'm not sure which, uh, to circumnavigate the globe uh, alone. So she set out and she made it all the way to the South Indian Ocean. And then she got involved in this huge storm with uh, 30 and 40 foot seas. Uh, her boat rolled over several times, went underwater several times, popped back up. Uh, her mast broke in half <laughs> and she lost uh, most of her communications. She had a sat phone, but uh, for some reason wasn't able to, to use it to call out. But she did have the EPIRB and it did what it was supposed to do and uh, they were able to find her. So we were talking about remoteness the closest land she was near, you know, is about as far away from land as you could possibly get, you know. So she had a better chance of going down to Antarctica than going over there to Australia. Anyway, she was uh, so grateful she came by to visit us at her office in Suitland and to learn more about the system. So uh, here's our, our building here. Uh, this is the back of our building, but if you went over to the front, you would see uh, three smaller dishes, and that's, uh, those are Sarsat dishes that we use uh, right above our building. Uh, so that was just one example. Uh, since uh, these numbers are from 1982 when we formally took over the program, but uh, in the United States, there's been over 7,400 saves and worldwide, there have been over 37,000. So generally, once a year, around 250 saves occur uh, because of SARSAT. And we count those if SARSAT was the only or the primary use of, uh, of finding that location. So if someone uh, calls the Coast Guard on the radio and then their boat sinks, but the Coast Guard responds because of the radio contact, then we won't count it. But uh, if the Coast Guard responds only because of location information from the, uh, the EPIRB or ELT or, or PLB, then we count it as a save. So, uh, so anyway, in the US, uh, about 250 a year are saved, and then worldwide, about 2,000 a year are saved. And that number keeps going up with the amount of beacons that are uh, bought per year. So uh, uh, it's getting you know, even more and more as the beacon population increases. There's, NOAA is reaching, well, our NOAA weather satellites are reaching the end of their service life. And so uh, for the past 30 some odd years, uh, we've been using basically the same technologies that were available from the Nimbus program. So it's been uh, a very long and productive uh, use of that technology. And uh, the next set of satellites that are gonna go up where we can put SARSAT equipment on are our GPS satellites. And uh, since this is an international program, we have other international partners. So Europe's Galileo satellites are similar to our GPS, their global navigation system. will have this on it as well. And uh, the Russian GLONASS uh, system will also have it. And that's Russia's version of GPS, it's their uh, uh, positioning system. Uh, what this will give SARSAT is uh, uh, better location availability. Uh, when these satellites are up, uh, there will be about 72 satellites in the, in the, in the constellation. And uh, with that number of satellites, anywhere on Earth should be in view of four satellites at any, any given time. So, Basically, the entire Earth uh, will have 100% coverage 100% of the time with the, the MEOSAR system. So as soon as someone turns on their beacon now, then almost instantly we'll know within a couple of meters where someone is versus a couple hundred uh, yards or a couple, you know, several kilometers. So, uh, you know, we've gone from several kilometers to several hundred yards to two or three meters of accuracy, and uh, the timing keeps getting better too. Uh, also another uh, advantage is the size of the, of the uh, 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 watch circle for 
uh, lack of a better word to call it. Uh, if you see the, uh, the polar orbiting satellites, that's that 2,500 mile diameter. Here you have almost as large of a diameter as the uh, geostationary satellites. And then imagine 72 of those overlapping each other. So uh, much more capability. So we've had a 30 year run of using the, the uh, uh, Nimbus technology and now we're reaching the end of that and going ahead for 30 more years and it's all thanks to NASA and their development team and uh, we certainly uh, are better off for having it. So thank you.